Class, the purpose of this video is to give you uh, sort of a brief overview on the topic of hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is perhaps the most important topic that we will be tackling during this course. And in fact, it will occupy our time from now to the rest of the semester. So it is a very important, very crucial topic, which hinges on the work that we did on sampling distributions. And you may recall a couple of things before I get into hypothesis testing, that um, when we take as many possible samples of a given size from a population, then we get sample statistics. And the collection of all these sample statistics, such as uh, the sample mean, gives us a sampling distribution of the mean, all right? Now remember, each of these means are estimates of the true population mean, mu. And when we get, um, if we tend to get values that are very extreme, then sometimes they suggest that perhaps the original population mean or what we believe about the population mean might be questionable. Uh, so you may recall a couple of questions where we said, we made an assumption that the population mean was a given value, calculated the probability of observing a sample mean, and in the cases when that was rather small, we said, well, small means rare, rare means significant, which means that if, for example, the mean is supposed to be 42, and we got a sample mean of 48, we say, what's the likelihood of getting a sample mean of 48 in a random sample of, say, 100? if the true mean is 42, and if that turns out to be very small, you have one or two options. One, you may have found the outlier, or it might very well be that the mean is no longer 42, but rather something more than 42. Okay, now I, I went over this because we need that kind of logic uh, for us to make sense of hypothesis testing. All right, so what I just talked about was the idea that we make an assumption about a population we look at the sample evidence, and if the likelihood of that sample is very small, but it happens, we question the original assumption about the population parameter. So that brings us to hypothesis testing. What is hypothesis testing? Well, in statistics, we make claims. We often make a claim about a population parameter, because remember, we don't always know what it is. And we didn't want to test the claim. For example, we could we could claim uh, that the average time someone spends texting in a day, a youth, for example, might be about four hours of texting in, a, in an 18-hour day or 16-hour day. And we want to test that. So what would we do? We would actually go about making this claim, and then we would proceed to find evidence to support it. So if we believe, on average, a young person spends about five hours texting, then we would take a random sample and we could decide what sample size we're going to use. And hopefully, if we get evidence, a sample statistic that is close to five, then that would be good. Then that would be sort of supporting that claim. But what if we got values that are much less than five, like three or two? But what's the chance that if somebody spends an average uh, five hours texting that we will get in a sample an average of three or two? Well, this should not happen uh, very often because that's a big difference. The sampling error between two and five is large. And so chances are the young people are not spending five hours. They're actually spending less than that. And of course, the same can be said for if um, we got large values like eight hours in a random sample then we could question whether or not it's really five hours that they're spending on average, but perhaps even more. Okay, so hypothesis testing is really this. We make a claim, and then we set about trying to find evidence to support that claim. Okay, and uh, in some cases we find the evidence, in some cases we don't find it. And so let's just go through a couple of these slides to kind of um, get a feel for what hypothesis testing is all about. Well, it belongs to the realm of what we call inferential statistics, where we look at sample data and we make or we draw conclusions about the population. All right? 
And so you I you are basically gathering statistical evidence to support or reject a particular claim about a parameter in the population. Um, so as you can see, a hypothesis is a claim, an assumption about that parameter. For example, the mean monthly cell phone bill in this city of Halifax is $42. Or we could say that the proportion of adults in the city with cell phones is 68%. That could be a claim. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's okay. Let's test it. And then this is where we actually go ahead and try to find the evidence. Now, what we do in terms of a formal process, there are these several steps that we take. But the first thing that we do is we, call, we state hypotheses. In other words, claiming that the true proportion of adults with cell phones is 68%. That's one hypothesis. But then an alternate hypothesis is that it is not 68%. It's something different. It could either be more than 68 or less than 68 so we call those hypotheses opposing hypotheses, all right? So one hypothesis we call the null, which states the assumption or the default position. So for example, we might say, let's use our default position as um, pi is equal to 68% or 0.68. That's our default. Or in this example here, the average number of television sets in a home is at least three. So that's our default. Mu is greater than or equal to 3. All right? And always remember that it's always about a population parameter. So notice that we have mu here and not x bar. You cannot hypothesize about a sample statistic because that's what you observe. You hypothesize about something you don't know. And what is it that we don't know? The population parameters. All right? So we begin with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. We call it our status quo. And it usually contains an equal to sign or less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And our whole objective is to see if the evidence that we gather helps to reject that status quo. So, for example, in a law court, when we say somebody is innocent until proven guilty, well, it's the responsibility of the prosecution to find evidence to reject the assumption of being innocent. All right? So that's kind of what we're doing here. So as I was saying to you, we frame these two hypotheses. The null, which is what we will assume is true, that's our default position, and the alternate is directly opposite to that. So if we're assuming that households have at least three television sets, then the alternate to that is they don't have three television sets. They have less than three television sets, in which case, notice that HA, and we denote that by HA, and it never contains an equal to sign. All right? And... What we do is we support the alternate or the alternative hypothesis by either reject by rejecting the null. If we don't reject the null hypothesis, then we cannot support the alternate hypothesis. That's why they're opposite to each other. So it has to be one or the other. If our evidence does not allow us to reject the null hypothesis, then we have not supported the alternate. If our evidence allows us to reject the null hypothesis, then we have supported the alternate. Okay? Another name for that hypothesis is called a research hypothesis. Okay, so here's an example. Ford Motor Company has worked to reduce road noise inside the cab of the redesigned F-150 pickup truck. It would like to report in its advertising that the truck is now quieter. The average of the prior design was 60 decibels at 60 miles per hour. So what is the appropriate hypothesis test? So we can frame two hypotheses. So what is it claiming? It's claiming that the average now is better than what it was before. So we'll, we'll say, okay, well, let's assume that it is what it was before, 68 decibels. So that's what we will use as our null hypothesis, that is either 68 or worse. So it's not quieter than what it was before. So if it's not quieter, then it's either 68 decibels or more. And now we want to support this hypothesis. We want to prove that the average is now 68, less than 68, sorry. So that's why we have HA, all right? So if we reject HO, we are supporting HA. If we do not reject HO, then we are not supporting HA. And that's kind of like how it goes, all right?
Here's another example. The average annual income of buyers of, four, of the Ford F-150 pickup truck is claimed to be 65000 per year. An industry analyst would like to test this claim. So, what are the hypotheses? Well, remember the claim was that the income is 65000 a year. So, what we will do is we'll say, let us assume that it is 65000 Now, let's see if we have evidence that it's not 65000 All right? And um, we would set about trying to find evidence to support that. Now, when we make claims and we look at statistical evidence to try to support or not support a claim, there's always the chance of an error. And let's face it, because you're making the decision based on a sample. Samples aren't always totally right, right? Samples are supposed to get it right, but we could certainly get sample data that did not give us the right conclusion. So there are two possible types of errors. Okay, One we call a type 1 error. That is, we could actually assume the null hypothesis is true, but the evidence makes us reject it. Right? So what it means is that maybe the null hypothesis is in fact true. We assume that it's true to begin with. But what if it were actually true, but the sample evidence tells us it is not true? So that's a case of an error because we should not have rejected the null hypothesis. And, we're, and, and there's a probability of that happening. Okay? And we call that type 1 error or the level of significance of the test. That is, what's the chance of rejecting the null hypothesis if it is in fact true? And we could actually compute. That, I, that, that, that probability. It's sort of like calling an innocent person guilty, right? That's an example of a type 1 error. The person is really, we assume they're innocent, but it turns out that they are in fact innocent, but they, there was some circumstantial evidence that led us to convict that person. That person is going to be sent to jail wrongly, and as a result of that, we would have committed type 1 error. And we have to try to minimize that. Now, the opposite also happens, which is the null hypothesis can be false, but we were not able to reject it. So the person could actually be guilty, but we were not able to prove that they were innocent. And we call that a type 2 error. And we, and we use the symbol beta, beta to, um, to denote that. All right? And um, so here's a summary for us in terms of the types of. Um, uh, errors and so on. So the state of nature means what is true, but is the outcome, what we decide to do, our decision. So let's say HO is true. If we do not reject HO, then the probability of that is 1 minus alpha, and therefore there is no error. But if we reject it and HO is true, we have committed type 1 error. If HO is false, that means we are supposed to reject it in our decision, but we did not, then we have type 2 error. But if we did reject HO, then we have a no error, and the probability of that is 1 minus beta. And as I get into this um, topic, I will explain to you why we really don't have any control, direct control over beta, but we do have direct control over alpha. And that is because we decide the value of alpha. Now remember, alpha is the significance of a test. Remember I mentioned... Um, alpha or, or the significance level has to do with whether or not we consider something rare or important or significant. And when the probabilities are small, we consider them significant. So we could decide that 5% is significant or 10% is significant or 1% is significant. So we set the value of alpha and what we do is then we compare the probability of observing the samples that we get to alpha. And if the probabilities that we get are smaller than alpha, then we have to conclude that the sample is significant and reject the null hypothesis. All right? So keep in mind this concept of significance. Small probabilities mean an event is rare. When a rare event happens, it is significant. And it causes you to reconsider your initial assumption. And I gave you a crazy example of your best friend being trustworthy. But if your best friend stole from you, then they're not trustworthy. In other words, 
if your best friend is trustworthy and should not steal from you, what's the likelihood that they should steal from you? It should be very small, near zero. So if they've stolen from you, that's a significant event. And it causes you to go back to your initial assumption, oh my God, this person was not trustworthy to begin with. And that is what hypothesis testing is all about. We will get into the formulas later, but this was just to introduce you to the topic. And hopefully you've had a chance to review this before we get into the subject matter. Okay?